Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's joint webinar hosted by both BGL and Macquarie Bank. We're excited to have you join us today as we'll be discussing thriving in a low return environment and leveraging best practice cash management to improve client outcomes. Today, we are lucky enough to be joined by Olivia Mercado. Olivia is Head of Deposits and Payment Products for the Banking and Financial Services Division of Macquarie Bank. All questions, including technical issues, please use the Q&A section and I'll answer them as soon as I can. However, questions regarding the content will be answered by Olivia at the end of the webinar. This webinar will also be recorded and will be posted on the BGL community page within the next day or two. Now, I'll start us off by passing you over to Olivia. Olivia, welcome to the webinar. Thanks, Ryan. And welcome, and welcome to, our to our webinar today. We're focusing on thriving in a low return environment. My name's Olivia McArdle. I'm the Head of Deposits and Payments Products here at Macquarie in our Banking and Financial Services Division. I am also an accountant by background, uh, so a chartered accountant. Originally started at uh, small firm Manjard uh, and then moved to uh, Coopers and Librand many years ago, um, spending some time after that at MLC. Um, and then I've been at Macquarie the last 15 years. Um, and most recently in our banking and financial services team for about four years. Uh, you've got my details there. We will have time for Q&A at the end, but if something occurs to you after the fact, please feel free to uh, drop me a line. LinkedIn is probably best. So in today's webinar, we'll cover a couple of different uh, sections. We'll look at our macro environment and how that's challenging. We've got some research to share about business performance in the current environment. We'll look at what that research means for your firm and also what the opportunity is for your current clients and potential new clients. And finally, we'll end some, with some actions and next steps. In terms of licensing, I'm conscious that some of you will be licensed, some of you will have access to licensed planners within your firm and, and some of you will be unlicensed. So the data in the deck that I'll go through today, it's relevant for all of you and where there's things that may impact you differently if you're depending on your licensing situation. I'll do my best to call that out, but I'm also obviously relying on you to be cognizant of your own licensing situation. In terms of the macro environment, initially we look at the global economy. So from the perspective of Macquarie's Wealth Management Investment Strategy Team, throughout April and May this year, we had rising trade concerns that undermined confidence in a global economic recovery. This was coupled with the belief that central banks were providing insufficient monetary policy support to stem emerging growth weakness and provide enough oxygen for financial markets. Since then, we have seen a substantial reversal in policy direction from the key central banks, so the Fed and the ECB. This appears to be insurance against further growth weakness and Macquarie believes that if needed, they will respond with additional stimulus to prolong the economic cycle. As a result, markets that were tracking sideways for some time have been given another boost, with key global benchmarks now pushing to all-time highs. Macquarie believes that markets have priced in a lot of this additional stimulus, and so further upside will need evidence that economic momentum is actually improving. Ultimately, the immediate outlook will depend on how the trade negotiations proceed. Any breakdown in talks on top of we obviously had yesterday's uh, UK leadership uh, change and that could quickly undermine growth and financial markets. If we switch, we've talked about global economy, but how about the local economy? So domestically, we had a surprise coalition, coalition election win and this was seen by the Macquarie Investment Strategy Team as investor friendly. That combined with the RBA rate cuts and the easing of credit restrictions by APRA provided the support that local equity markets needed to close early in July at an 11 year high and within 100 points of an all time high. But the picture is very different in the cash and property spheres. The official cash rate is currently sitting at a record low after the RBA cut rates in July for the second month in a row and there is talk in the media of another possible rate cut before Christmas. Clients are also facing declines in property prices in major capital cities so we are starting to see the declines taper off. At Macquarie, we expect to see a further slowing in the rate of the price declines over the next few months, at which point we believe prices will stabilise and then start rising modestly. 
So we've talked about the global economy and then the local economy. Let's move outside of that now and look at post Royal Commission reg environment. And we see that our firms are facing a number of challenges. So you've got accountants and we're still adapting to changes to the limited AFSL licensing regs. Those of you that hold an AFSL or a limited license are also now facing changing advisor education standards. And you're also facing a shifting regulatory environment. It's likely that the full scope of changes as a result of the Royal Commission will probably take 12 to 18 months to be realised, but those changes are likely to include ending grandfathered commissions to financial advisors and the potential of annual fee opt-ins. So it's a challenging time for advisors and accountants and there's probably going to be uncertainty for a while yet. Finally, in terms of the social environment, it's a challenging time for clients as well. So while Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand report that trust in accountants remains high, financial planners not faring so well. According to investment trends, trust and satisfaction with financial planners is at an all-time low. And with only 20% of Australians getting financial advice and many more needing it, but they're being put off by things like cost or a perceived lack of independence within the industry, there's definitely scope to find ways to make financial advice more palatable for the many Australians who need it. In this environment, Macquarie has conducted two pieces of proprietary research. Firstly, we did the accounting and financial services benchmarking research. So this was a survey of business leaders where we benchmarked a firm's financials and performance, as well as exploring sentiment around key industry trends. Secondly, we, we completed the propensity project. So this is where we spoke to end clients and we surveyed them, the clients of advisors and accountants and explored their overall satisfaction with their advisor, their propensity to stay with their advisor, so the retention, their propensity to refer their advisor and their propensity to do even more business with their advisor. And in today's webinar, I'm going to draw on some key insights from both of these studies and we'll identify how both you as a firm can thrive and how you can help your clients thrive in a low return environment. So we'll kick off with some of the headline financial information and business performance stats from our 2018 Accounting and Financial Services Benchmarking Report. So first off, we saw that of the accountants who responded to our survey, their average reported Average self-reported EBIT was 39%. 75% of accounting firms who responded enjoyed positive profit growth, but that also meant that the other 25% of the firms who responded had negative profit growth. And of the 75% who enjoyed the growth, 34% of those only had a profit increase of between 0 and 5%. If we look at billing, the clients of the advisors and accountants who responded, 52% of their clients were billed less than 5K per year, 19% between 5 and 10 per year, a further 10% between 10 and 20, and then a remaining 19% more than 20K. Looking at debtor days, 78% had debtor days less than 45 days. Salary benchmarks. So now conscious that these are 2017 slash 18 reported figures, but as we know, they're unlikely to have changed too much. And we'll be back in the market later this year to resurvey salaries across the industry. But what this data tells us is that partners and principals who are advisors and accountants, were looking at 190K per year, senior accountants about 100K, juniors, 58 and then our admin staff around 55. And you please note here that the partner salaries excluded distributions. Finally, in terms of average clients per accountant, we saw that partners and principals were managing 117 clients, seniors 76 and juniors 42. Our benchmarking research benchmarked firms' financial performance but it also explored key industry trends. And as part of the research, we asked advisors and accountants 
do you believe the role of the advisor is evolving? And 96% of respondents said yes. Off the back of that, we then asked, what do you think the business model of the future looks like? Around one third think it will be a higher proportion of client facing staff with technology as support. And in this case, technology means more automation to create efficiencies around non value add tasks. Another third thought that it would be a centralised relationship model within a multidisciplinary practice. And here we're seeing firms employ client relationship managers, and those client relationship managers have ultimate responsibility for the client, but then they connect them with an SMSF specialist, an accountant or, or a lawyer, whatever the relevant responsibility is, depending on the specific need at that point in the client's journey. So you've got two thirds that think the future is focused on the client, and the remaining third think that the business model of the future will be a specialist practice with connections to other advisors. So the majority of the firms are already focused on the client. So what are we seeing firms doing differently as they shift towards an even more client focused experience? The key thing here is that firms like yours are no longer being compared to other financial services providers. You're no longer being compared to the accountant in the next suburb. You're not even being compared to a bank or a larger financial institution. Today, as the CEO of Pershing once said, the best experience you have anywhere becomes the experience that you expect everywhere. Outside of our industry, we see brands like Amazon, TransferWise, Netflix, put the customer at the center of everything they do. They've got a really deep understanding of their customers and they provide a service that anticipates their customers' needs, sometimes before the customer has even realized they have a need. These firms, the Amazons of the world, the Netflix, they are raising the bar on client experience and they are raising your client's expectations as they do it. In our world, financial services, accounting, SMSS, advice, how can you anticipate client needs? In an environment where growth is, broadly speaking, reasonably low, how can you craft a client experience that meets more of their needs? One way to frame this question is to think like a business, to go back to the two common measures for monitoring a business's financial position. That is the P&L, the income statement, and the balance sheet. So on the income side, we know that the wage growth is low. Earlier in the presentation, I touched on that when we reflected on accountants' salaries. And on the asset side, we've touched on the challenges for the asset environment, particularly in the cash and property spheres. On the liability part, we also know that clients are facing challenges. In March this year, the ABS reported that Australian household debt had hit record highs. So in this environment, where can you add the most value? And if we apply the think like a business approach, how can you help clients build their assets and reduce their liabilities in an environment where their income is not necessarily increasing at the rate that it used to? And where do your clients need the most help? expenses. In the current environment, we're seeing expense management, that is cash flow management, as one of the key opportunities for helping clients manage the expense side of the equation to enable them to continue to both pay down liabilities and increase their wealth. When we're talking to advisors about offering cash flow management services, one of the key things we hear is that there's challenges around the visibility of client data. It's not always easy to see a client's financial information when it sits outside their portfolio or outside of your ecosystem. But one of the key things that will help overcome this is open banking. Open banking, so just to recap, it'll require data holders like banks to share customer data with other institutions at the client's direction. So with open banking, the impacts of these barriers will be reduced and it will be easier for you to access your client's data with their permission, obviously, from a platform of your choice. McKinsey has highlighted some of the benefits it sees in open banking, from an improved customer experience to new revenue streams and the ability to build a sustainable business model for underserved markets. 
In financial services, much like we're seeing firms like Netflix and Amazon dominate client experience in the retail and discretionary spending spheres, internationally, brands like WeChat, Tencent, Alipay are already exploring ways that they can use open banking style models to deliver more services to more clients. And in local markets, we're working with personal financial management apps to use open APIs to help accountants and advisors have a better visibility of their clients' data. Essentially, open banking means that clients will be able to provide consent for financial institutions and tech platforms to use secure technology to access their data, with the client having the ability and transparency to maintain control and, of course, revoke the connection as they need to. This could ultimately give accountants and advisors the ability to work with clients to track spending across multiple banks and accounts and ultimately better manage their cash flow. With the client's permission, it will help you access highly personalised and accurate data and therefore provide recommendations that are predictive and based on true customer behaviour. So if we bring all of that data and market context together, on the firm performance side, many accountants are struggling to achieve growth, with over a quarter falling into the negative growth territory. And it's in that environment we see an opportunity to help meet the needs of the client by focusing on the expense side of the ledger via cash flow management services to help your clients continue to grow their assets and reduce their liabilities in a challenging investment environment. So this could present an opportunity for your firm to meet this increasing client demand in one of three ways. You could introduce cash flow management services for individual clients or proactively promote those services if you already offer them. You could build strong referral relationships within your firm. If there's an accountant or an advisor within your firm better equipped to deliver these services in partnership with you. And then you increase your share of wallet with some of your clients. Finally, for those of you that don't have an AFSL, you could build a strong referral partnership with a like-minded financial advisor. And later in the webinar, I'll touch on some of the ways that you can do this. But are the right types of clients getting cash flow management support today? Are those who could benefit most from a focus on expenses over asset growth getting the help they need? Or is there a gap in the market? So who's got the greatest need? One of the things our Propensity Project, which was our end client research, does is explore client pain points, which is major financial decisions they expect to make in the next five years. And when we look at this data, we can see that the cash flow needs of retirees, those who generally are more likely to receive cash flow management assistance from their advisor, they're very different from the cash flow needs of their 30 to 44 year old counterparts. <clears throat> Those older than 60 are facing far fewer major financial decisions and incurring far fewer liabilities. But when we look at the 30 to 44 year olds, they're expecting to make major investments and incur major debts. And that's where cash flow management support can become crucial to helping them minimize those debts and continue to grow their wealth. If we go back to Amazon, TransferWise and Netflix model of deeply understanding and anticipating our clients' needs, what else do we know about the 30 to 44 year old age group? So we know that 73% manage their money with their life goals in mind, 54% agree that they think their financial situation is pretty secure in the case of an economic downturn, but 68% feel that their day-to-day -day costs of living are getting a bit out of control. So how can you deliver cash flow management services? We know that this group is in a period of their lives where they're making major purchasing decisions and incurring significant debt. And we know that almost half don't feel secure in their financial situation and they're feeling the pressure of the cost of living. How can you develop a cash flow management offer that meets the needs of these clients? So there's four steps to consider and I'll touch on each of them briefly. The first is to sell them on the why. 
30 to 44 year olds are busy, busy people and we can see that their budgets are already tight. Consider how you can communicate the benefits and take away the pain points. One of the easiest ways to achieve this is to give them examples of the benefits as they have to come to life for people like them. Take an example from your client base of a 30 to 44 year old couple or individual who've uncovered significant savings during the initial cash flow management setup phase, or a client who's reached their goals in a tangibly faster way. Find stories to bring the why to life. The second is to give them the tools they need. And what do we mean by that? When we look at our propensity project data, which is our end client research, we found that 37% of clients 30 to 44 year old want more general education communications from their advisor or accountant. This age group is by now used to learning online, but they need help distilling what's important and what's relevant. And they're looking for a trusted source of truth. Given that they're mature enough to have sought financial advice, and in some of your cases, they may have opened an SMSF, they're likely to be a little past Finance 101, but we talked earlier about how they're feeling overwhelmed by the cost of living, how almost half of them feel under-equipped to deal with a downturn. How can you help them understand how to navigate these challenges and how can you do it in a scalable, repeatable way? Because that's the key here. If you can invest in developing some simple education tools, it might be a fact sheet to help sell them the benefits or a budgeting spreadsheet or a tool, or even recommend a, one of those personal financial management apps to help them track their spending. There'll be two key benefits. Firstly, your client will be able to access the tools, read them, interact with them, watch them at a time that's convenient to them. And secondly, you'll be able to use the same tools over and over again, getting more value for your time investment and decreasing your cost to serve each client. And better yet, this is where you can age, engage the support of some of the millennials in your own teams. Find someone in your team who's passionate. Find someone on a growth trajectory and task them with building your firm's cash flow management program. At Macquarie, we're even working with some risk advisors who are looking for development opportunities to both meet more of their clients' needs and increase their planning skills, and they are seeing cash flow management as the next logical step for their growth. The third pet thing is to price the offer to meet the life stage. And what do I mean by that? With the firms we work with, we're seeing a few different ways of achieving this. Firstly, some firms are developing specific short digital courses that they can deliver to multiple clients at one time and charge a fee for. It's almost like an entry point for getting financial advice for 30 to 44 year olds. Typically, a course might go for somewhere between 12 weeks to 12 months. It will be delivered in the form of weekly lessons or online videos covering the fundamentals of financial wellbeing, including cash flow management. The courses are often supported by a closed Facebook group, online tools and resources, and weekly online chat sessions with the advisor or accountant. Often, clients can upgrade to access face-to-face -face sessions or more comprehensive advice or services. The second way we're seeing is that other firms are creating a tiered service offer. So you've got entry level pricing, a mid tier, and then a bells and whistles offer. Each of these tiers comes with a clearly defined set of service levels. And we've even seen a few firms develop a pricing tier that targets small business owners. And for accountants in the audience, this is a great opportunity to expand your engagement with a client. These style packages offer small business accounting services packaged up with personal advice and cash flow management. The key here is in setting expectations and boundaries, delivering against them and regularly reinforcing them so that your clients know what to expect, they feel their needs are being met, and they understand that the amount they're prepared to invest in advice directly correlates to the service they can expect. The different tiers also help you defend against bracket creep. If a client asks for a service that's outside their tier, you can then offer to move them up to the next tier at a cost. Thirdly, the other thing we're seeing, and this is getting quite big in the US, is month-to-month -month pricing. 
So 30 to 44 year olds don't have a large asset base, so percentage based fees aren't necessarily profitable for your firm. And they don't benefit from the end client either because they don't allow flexibility in the level of service they receive. But this age group, they're used to paying for things by the month. You think they're mobile, their internet plan, health insurance, their gym. Subscription style pricing is, obvious, is often more manageable for them. The final way we're seeing firms pricing cash flow management is an upfront charge for the initial exploration plus setup, and then maybe a small monthly or an annual addition to the existing advice fee. So have a think about what option might be most suitable for your firm. Finally, cash flow management for 30 to 44 year olds is less about set and forget or expect me to own and manage this myself and much more about adopting a coaching mentality. We're starting to see some accountants and planners adopting this coaching style language. The idea of a coach, so someone who's gonna work with me to help me achieve my goals it shifts the education from passive to active. It's education with a purpose, and that purpose is achieving financial freedom. The added benefit of using language like this is that it opens the door to keep the, keeping the accountant, or sorry, keeping the client accountable. The coach expects participation. If a client is being coached, it's not a spectator sport. That's what drives the engagement the most. It's the taking of personal responsibility. Explain to your client what they have to do and how they can take responsibility for doing it and then keep them accountable on that journey. So what happens when you get it right? The most important thing is you'll be meeting the needs of the client. You'll be helping them address their fears of being unable to manage in a downturn and reduce their cost of living pressures and you'll be moving them closer to their goals. But secondly, 30 to 44 year olds are the highest referring age group. 62% of end clients we surveyed in 2018 had recommended their advisor in the past 12 months, and that compared to 49% across the board. Obviously, referrals drive growth, and growth can drive increased profits, all very important in a low growth environment. So what's next? We know that in a challenging environment, 30 to 44 year olds have some specific needs around cash flow management. As SMSF accountants, what can you do about it? For those of you with an AFSL, think about how can you introduce cash flow management services to your clients using one of the pricing models we've discussed? What educational tools can you develop to help clients understand the benefits of managing their cash flow and get them on the right track? For those without the AFSL, can you refer your clients to an advisor within your own firm to increase the firm's share of wallet with that client? And if you don't offer financial advice within your firm, can you build a relationship with a like-minded advisor? The reality here is that clients are increasingly demanding cash flow management services. And if they can't get it off you, they might find it somewhere else. And the risk is if they get that cash flow support somewhere else, and that somewhere else also offers SMSF administration, you may risk losing the client to a firm that's got a more robust proposition that meets more of their needs. So there's a few tips for building strong referral partner relationships. The first is pretty obvious. Look for a firm that offers complementary, not competing services. But from there, it's important that you find a referral partner who aligns to your values and culture. It's not about choosing an advisor from Google and hoping that she's the right one for you. It's a very personal thing. There will be some advisors you click with and others that you don't. And it's worth persevering until you find the one that you click with. And sometimes that's the case whether you're looking in the open market to find an advisor or whether you're just looking down the hall to finding an advisor within your own firm that you feel comfortable with. You need someone you trust to look after your clients to the same calibre that you do. And that's not always easy to find. Once you've found an advisor you connect with, you need to invest in the relationship. We typically suggest you meet with your referral partners at least quarterly for a coffee. Make sure they understand the scope of your services and talk about the value you add. And that you can do the same about their services and their value. 
Like with any relationship, it takes time to nurture and grow, and the more effort you put in, the stronger the rewards will be. So with that in mind, a quick recap before we wrap up. We're currently facing a volatile market in a number of ways. We've got the lowest ever cash rate, declining property prices and volatile equity markets. Accounting firms are struggling to maintain profit growth in that environment. So how can we help our clients continue to build wealth and how can we help our firms grow? In terms of clients, they're increasingly needing help with cash flow management and cash flow management is an important way to grow wealth via managing expenses in an environment where asset growth is more challenging. But today, generally speaking, retirees get the lion's share of cash flow management advice, while it's the 30 to 44 year olds who could really benefit from it most. 30 to 44 year olds are feeling the pinch of a perceived increase in the cost of living. Nearly half of them doubt their ability to manage in a financial downturn. So helping them with education and tools is a good starting point for introducing cash flow management services to these clients. For your firm, this could represent an opportunity to add a new service line to your firm's offer or to more heavily promote an existing one. For those of you with an AFSL, the services could be offered internally. For those without, there's an opportunity to build referral partnerships with licensed planners who do offer this service to ensure you continue to meet the changing needs of your clients, adding value and helping them grow their wealth. So that comes to the end of the material. I'll have a look now at uh, some of the questions that have come through. So the first question is, will accountants be drawn into open banking by having to share SMSF data from BGL or is it only banks? So in terms of this question, the legislation is not yet passed. It only was reintroduced to Parliament this week, so all of us are waiting with bated breath to see what will be finalised. However, as it's currently drafted, initially it is only uh, ADIs, so authorised deposit institutions, who fall under the open banking regime. Um, initially it will be the big four banks who will go first and then all other banks will follow. Of course, anyone can go early if they like, but it'll be the big four banks that start the process. As I said before, the legislation is not yet passed and um, it'll be a matter of having a look at that when it's passed to see what the actual details are. Oh, I've got another question from Debbie Whiting. Debbie, are you able to um, type your question into the Q&A panel so that we can make sure we can address that for you? Ah, here we go. And can you explain, we've got another question that's come through, can you explain a little bit more about what open banking is? Sure. So open banking, I guess basically I think about it as giving customers, so banking clients, the power to decide what data they'll share with what organisations and then it's up to us as banks to ensure that that is done in a safe and secure manner. Uh, so an example is um, the, the first products that are in the draft legislation are, are transaction accounts and savings accounts. And what we see a number of people these days, the idea that you only have accounts with one bank is, is sort of a, a dated idea. Most people have um, accounts with numerous banks and they find it difficult to keep on top of where those accounts are held, uh, let alone the interest rates that they're earning on those different accounts. So what open banking will do is it'll make that um, easier for the client to say, well, I want to share um, all of the accounts that I have with all of the banks with either my advisor's platform uh, or maybe with a personal financial management app that I'm using or something like that. Once they've shared that data uh, with the client's permission, it'll then help the client to manage that. So either they can manage their expenses better because they can see in one spot where they're spending out of the different accounts, or better yet, they'll be able to see the different interest rates that they're earning on the different accounts and compare that uh, to what else is available in the market and see if they can get a better offer. So 
So the whole idea behind open banking is it puts the customer back in the driver's, driver's seat about finding a, a better offer for themselves. But it's up to us as the, the banks to ensure that we provide uh, the infrastructure, if you like, so that that is done in a safe and secure manner. And also it's really important that, to note that the customer is able to revoke that sharing at any point. So if they've you know, done their analysis and thought, yep, I'm across it now, I don't want to keep sharing my data, then they'll be able to go into their banking app or, or wherever and click a revoke button and that data access will be turned off immediately. Um, so that's a really important point as well. Um, and so the next question that's come through is who will be responsible for the data or open banking app and is there a cost? Um, so who will be responsible? So each bank um, that uh, participates is, is responsible and it's the cost is ours uh, to ensure that the infrastructure is set up in a, a safe and secure manner. Um, as part of the legislation, they are setting up an independent um, certification body, if you like, that will ensure that all the relevant platforms that data is being shared with, they have to be uh, certified by this, um, by this group that the government is setting up. Um, and what that does is ensures that each platform has the relevant security and, and all of that sort of policies and things in place so that it's a safe spot for customers to share their data with. Um, so each, whether you're a large platform like BGL or, or you're a small fintech app or something like that, um, if you want customers to be able to share data with you, you will have to be uh, certified by this um, body. Um, and then it's up to the banks to, to spend the money to get those data links in place. All right, so have, we've had no more questions come through. Um, I'll just do a final call for any more questions. Um, as always, you can contact me uh, after the webinar if something occurs to you later. Happy to, happy to cover that then. Um, if not, I think we're okay to wrap up. Yeah, okay, look, I think we'll wrap up. Uh, thanks very much for speaking with us, Olivia. That was great. Now, again, for the listeners, this has been recorded and will be posted on the BGL community in approximately a day's time. So if you wish to have another listen, you'll be able to find it there. Now, that concludes the webinar for today. Thank you all very much for attending.